Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of One Single Story, where each weekday we offer a brief lesson from a section of today's reading, and then we examine a single relevant question that passage points us to. Today I'm joined by Cheryl Doughty, and we're looking at a passage from Genesis chapter 46. We're going to talk about how God chooses and uses those that are unwanted. So modern day Christians um, have romanticized this role of shepherd in the scripture, We look at men like David, who was a shepherd, and Jesus, who called himself the good shepherd with this great affection. But it it can be shocking to us to recognize that the career of shepherd was this despised uh, career in in the ancient Near East during biblical times. In fact, the Egyptians despised shepherds, and it was, uh, was key to Pharaoh and the Egyptians not opposing Jacob's family from living in the area of Goshen in Egypt. That was one of the reasons why he didn't object to that. In the role of, sh- um, since the role of shepherd was despised, Goshen was basically unwanted. It was unused land, but it was perfect for keeping flocks, but it was undesirable territory in Egyptian society. And it was wise that they were not positioned in Egypt proper, but rather in the area of Sinai. From a political perspective, it would have been important for Joseph to communicate to Pharaoh and the Egyptians that he had no intention of bringing his family to work in the administration with him. This could have signaled to Pharaoh an intention for a hostile takeover, which was not unheard of during that time. The central theme of Scripture is obviously the coming of Jesus and the salvation of the world. Throughout that story, the humble The humble, the unwanted, and the despised are key elements associated with the plan of salvation. Shepherds have played an important role throughout the history of Israel. Along with their role is that element of humility God chooses to work through the unwanted and the despised. We certainly see that here in the story of Jacob's family moving to Egypt. They come into a nation in humility, settling in a territory that is despised and fulfilling a role that is unpopular. So what we have to take from this and understand is and remember is that God chooses to use the unwanted and the despised. David was a shepherd from God, selected as king. He was called a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13. The phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23 and 1, would have struck the biblical audience as a bit like the Lord is my truck driver might sound to us. This this important uh, yet a down-to-earth career, and I, I don't mean any offense to truck drivers, but that that's a way for us to understand it today. Shepherds were first to hear the angelic announcement of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, and they were the first to pay homage to the newborn king. Pastors take their role and their title from shepherding to care for the flock that God has entrusted uh, you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the good shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. So, um, Cheryl, let's talk about a couple of things. Why do you think God consistently chooses to use the unwanted and the despised. I feel like he consistently does that because it is a challenge for us to see people the way that he sees people and to see what, to see the same things as being important that he does because we so easily get wrapped up in thinking things are important that are not truly important to God. So, you know, we believe that money is incredibly important. It may be necessary, but it doesn't need to be what we spend our lives chasing after. We think that fame and power and beauty and possessions, you know, that all those things are so important. And the people that we would consider lowly or despised are people who normally don't have any of those things. Right. Or if they do, it's not enough for anybody to take notice of them. Um, so I think that it's constantly pushing against what we want to believe and what we are naturally drawn to being attracted to in people. Is some of that because those people are more distracted and unable to be used by God or listen to God in a particular moment? 
What people? Who have wealth or fame or um, resources or certain abilities. Are you asking, are they less likely to be used by God? Because for that of reason? that, yes. Well, that's actually one of the things that I had processed when I was thinking about this question because, I mean, a practical side of that on the other on the other side, the practical part of it is people who are already at the bottom of the barrel, for lack of a better term, don't have much to lose, right? And so it is easier, perhaps, for them to be used by God because if you, and I think we all can relate to this from the point of view that if you have ever felt like you were at your lowest point, it was also the time that you found it the most necessary and natural to trust God completely Mm -hmm. because in order to get back up, you are not going to be able to do it on your own, and you knew that. Right. And I also think that that is a reason that he is able to take people who do not necessarily get recognized for anything good or as anything important or anybody that's influential and use them in incredible ways because if you're willing, then he can use you. You know, it's not that he didn't use wealthy, talented gifted mm-hmm. individuals in scripture. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I was recently having a conversation with Barbara as we were riding, and I was talking specifically about some opportunities that have come my way in the last 12 to 48 months. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was saying to her that... Um, Had I had those opportunities when I was younger, I probably would not be doing what I'm doing mm-hmm. today. I probably would not be pastoring. I probably, there'd just be a lot of pieces that probably aren't present. And, you know, we talked about how that, um, because it is a distraction, uh, w- resources, money, gifts, talents, abilities, even. Even Paul talks about in the New Testament about being married. Mm-hmm. He says it's a distraction from serving God. Now mm-hmm. that goes against some some other things that we teach, right? But imagine because I, I, I I've, I've tried to process this. Imagine if you didn't have Kevin and two kids, right? Right. There are times in, in between um, podcasts you were talking about. I was listening to you say, you know, you went home yesterday and you cooked dinner and, you know, whatever. There are so many things you wouldn't be obligated to do without them in your life. And I'm not trying to no, discount them. That, that that you just, you know, you could be completely sold out, got everything you, every minute of my life you can have. And and sometimes you probably feel that I way. I mean, I try to be anyway, but I do need to sleep. Right, right. <laughs> but you, you know what I'm saying. I do. And but there, on the other side of that, there are so many things that I could not do without them. Certainly. Right. And I, I mean, things that God's calling me to do. Right. But, you know, there are things that can be blessings in our life, but also keep us back. Oh, yeah. I and, do want to also say that this is what I think Paul is saying. What I think he's saying is that if you can abstain from sex, mm-hmm. then you don't need to get married. But if you feel like you got to have it, then you need to get right. married because yeah. it's going to keep you clean and honest. Right. And but but your wife is going to be a distraction. It's better to marry or burn <laughs> That's what I than think burn. He's yeah. yeah. In the context of well, let me let me. You, you talked about when people are at the bottom, they don't have much to lose. Um, the times I have been. Yeah, probably most obedient or most willingly obedient to try something that I would not try any other time have been when I was most desperate, Mm -hmm. right? It could have been emotionally low, spiritually low, financially low, Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And I, I know this is, that's not the common take on this. You know, the common take is, um, God uses the lowly because that's who God is, and I'm not. I'm not discounting mm-hmm. that that's a part of God's nature. I just know that it is 
typically use typically easier to use people who are not as entangled with the things of the world, whatever they are. Um, so what do you what do you think that says about God, whether it's his ego or his plan, that he doesn't have to use the most influential, most talented, most wealthy person? What do you think it says about it? I think it says that God is not in the business of making good better, that God is in the business of making the lowly the most important. I don't think he needs any help. And he makes that obvious in situations like that. He can take what everybody considers worthless and turn it into what everybody needs. Right. He can turn it into the most important thing. I said, I think that that just tells us who he is. Well, thank you for joining us today on this edition of One Single Story. We hope you'll be back with us tomorrow as we continue our conversation around the book of Genesis. <laughs>